Kingsley Mogalu dumps the ADC after losing presidential primaries. And group urges INEC to extend its voter registration deadline. Well, this is Plus Politics. I'm Mary Anacom. A presidential aspirant of the African Democratic Congress, ADC, Professor Kingsley Mogalu, has resigned his membership of the party. Now, in his resignation letter, which was addressed to the party chairman, Okeng Mosu, Mogalu cited alleged infractions from the party's presidential primary election as reasons for leaving. Now, the former presidential candidate of Young Progressive Party in the 2019 general elections was defeated at the just-concluded primary elections at, of the ADC in Abelkuta. The winner, Dumebi Kachiku, as we all know, scored 977 votes. Mogalu polled 589 votes to come second. Well, joining us to discuss this is the Director of Media Strategy uh, to Professor Kingsley Mogalu, Michael Achimogu, and Good Governance Advocate Shegun Shopitong. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for joining you. us. Great. I'm going to start with you, Michael, um, because this is about your principle. Um, before we even get to the resignation part, um, I have spoken to several people um, on the issue of the presidential primaries and, of course, what exactly transpired. But you probably were there. Paint us a picture of what your principal, Mr. Mogalu, is referring to um, as um, some form of corruption that took place at the venue of the primaries. Oh, well, uh, thank you very much. The reasons why Professor Kingsley Mohali resigned from the ADC are clearly stated in his letter of resignation to the party. And there's no ambiguity there. You know, and it's instructive to note, uh, even before we go on, that he is not the only person who has left the party based on those uh, concerns. You, you might remember that just yesterday, um, Dr. Shamsuddin uh, Lamido, another presidential aspirant on the party's platform, also tendered his resignation, citing, you know, corruption, among other things. And even before these presidential primaries uh, came, uh, two members of the National Tesco, who uh, were based in Lagos, uh, also resigned from the party. I think um, Akin Braithwaite and um, another honorable, I forget his name now as well, and all of these persons have cited the same uh, concerns. Um, the party obviously did not um, keep its word, you know, as um, one that's different from the APC and the PDP. Uh, uh, and what with the sham that went on in Abiyokuta uh, was least expected and not agreeable to uh, the principles that ideals that Professor Kingsley Mohamed represents. And for that reason, uh, you know, uh, he chose to leave. Um, by the way, I have often wondered since yesterday why someone resigning from a party, which is a right, by the way, uh, should be should lead to controversy of any kind. But, well, here we are. Mm. Before we go into the controversial part of it, when you keep, you keep saying it's a sham, it's a sham, I'm trying to understand exactly what happened. Um, I did speak to um, a representative of the Electoral College who also said that there were high hopes uh, for the ADC and that there were young people who were going to be um, somewhat drafted to the party to understudy, um, you know, the inner workings of the party. But because of what happened at that primaries, uh, they had withdrawn those young people. Again, what exactly happened that made you uh, or you, Mr. Mogalu call this a sham? Um, these allegations, how true are they? Um, we heard that monies exchange hands. There was imposition of candidates. Um, who imposed these candidates and why? Who is alleging that money exchange hands and money from who to who? Well, we heard that the person who eventually um, emerged as the party flag bearer had induced, allegedly, um, the 
delegates with certain amounts of monies. Pay, um, some was given before the voting, and then the rest was redeemed right after. Because we were not there, I would really like to know exactly what transpired. So, well, um, before these primaries came up, the party itself had issued a communique um, ordering or instructing all aspirants not to have anything um, directly to do with the delegate. Delegates whom we didn't even know, by the way, until the day of the primaries. And uh, it was instructed that all aspirants should donate money to the national headquarters secretariat of the party so that they would take care of transportation, accommodation, and feeding for delegates. And so we didn't have access to any delegates from our side, you know. Only for us to find out two days, or on the eve, rather, of the primaries, that some as a particular aspirant had been given privileged access all by himself to all of the delegates. We didn't have the delegates list, you know. But we've spoken to some of the other aspirants as well, and they also complained that they had continued to ask for delegates list, and nobody gave access to them. But yeah, we have an aspirant, one of the aspirants who uh, literally confessed himself on TV yesterday that, you know, he was meeting with 14, between 14 to 15 uh, of the delegates per state, and he was given $900 each uh, to this delegate. We didn't have this information, you know. And we found out as well that despite the party having taken money from us, you know, in the, under the guise of providing accommodation, transport, and feeding for delegates, you know, some particular aspirants were allowed, you know, to have free arrangements for this same and, you know, logistics for delegates. We didn't have this information. We didn't have this knowledge. And it went against the rule of the party, you know. And so it gave unfair advantage uh, to some, some, some delegates, uh, to some aspirants. Um, it wasn't what we signed up for. Let me come to you, Shegun, because you are a good governance advocate. And, of course, you uh, work with civil society. Um, one would point to the big, the major political parties and the major players as... Uh, I mean, when we talk about corruption or vote buying, it's all the fingers are always pointed to the major parties. And then many people would hold the op opinion that these other parties might necessarily have better internal democracy as compared to the major parties. Uh, but we see that uh, the apple in this case does not necessarily fall far from the tree, does it? Yeah. Um Thanks, Marian. Um, I, I really, you know, must say that um, the way the whole process has gone so far, uh, both within the major political parties, um, APDPC, as I like to call them, because they are one and the same, those two parties, and between the other um, uh, smaller parties, the way the entire process has gone so far has been um, disappointing. Um, for the major political party, nobody expected anything less. Nobody expected anything better. Um, this is how they have run. Um, and the more we have moved forward in time, the worse their conduct has become in terms of um, um, what, what the boundaries are. You know, the, the floor is getting lower. You know, you think that they sunk a bit. To the, to the bottom of the of, of, of the of the ocean, if you like, and then they move the, the floor of the ocean even further down, and they go further down, you know. But for this other party, where some Nigerians would have wanted to invest a bit of hope, you know, in in, in because of the, the the fact that they can provide a platform for for supposedly better candidates, it extremely unfortunate and, and um, disappointing to find that it's just more of the same. It, it, the only difference is that the magnitude and the scale of the, um, um, uh, the, the financial value of the exchanges that are happening is less. But, you know, so if, if the APC and the PDP are sharing $50,000, $20,000, $40,000, $70,000 dollars per delegate, depending on who you listen to, Mm -hmm. The only difference between them and apparently this other party is that they are sharing one thousand, two thousand, five hundred, maybe even one hundred dollars per delegate, and that is that is extremely unfortunate. 
um, you know, because one had hoped that these other parties will do things differently and um, will, will be able to uh, perhaps uh, begin to push for some sort of an alliance between them to fight the two major parties. But now, what options you know, exist for Nigerians if this kind of thing could have been happening within the ADC? You know, and in 2019, similar things happened in the AAC. Um, that has um, uh, Mr. Yele Showare, you know, whether he's the candidate or the chairman, nobody even knows because they're still in court, you know. And, and we just have all of these types of incidents all over the place. Even in the SDC um, uh, primary, there were strong rumors that money actually did exchange hands, um, um, exchange hands between some of the, 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 the aspirants at the time and the delegates. You know, so, so where is the difference? So he looked at it, we have a much deeper, much more fundamental problem on our hands than we realize. And, and you just, uh, you just things, played to my next question, Shegun, because I was going to ask, yes. first part of the question was, should we write off every other political party because of what has happened uh, in the ADC or what's happened in the SDP or maybe another small party where uh, you have, uh, you know, show a rate. Should we you know, just as in hope for other parties other than the APC and the PDP, being that we're also seeing similarities. But then, going forward, should, like you said, there might be a bigger problem, which is fundamental. Uh, does this not necessarily mirror what our society has um, somewhat watered itself down to? And then, it, of course, it leaves us with the question of how do we change the parties if we don't change the people? Well, so, so for me, um, first of all, I, I, I like to think that we cannot blame a society for the failure of its leaders, even though the leaders came out of that society, right? So it's a bit of a cat 22 kind of situation where you're saying, okay, so if the, if, if the, if the people produce the leaders, then how can society change? But the truth of the matter is that the entirety of society um, is not bad, you know, and, and I have always maintained that the average human being has some good in him and has some bad. And for most people, the good generally tends to outweigh the bad, you know. So what determines what happens in a society is the, is the factors that, that, that promote either the good or the bad to, to be more evident in each individual in that society. You know, so I wouldn't want to say, oh, this is, this is, uh, we have a society problem and all of that. Right now, I think the solution might very well be that we need to identify the good people amongst us and find a way to get them into office, regardless of this political party structure. I'm tempted to this, ask, how me, do we get thing. them into we office? Have to get good people into office. Yeah, yeah, but uh, how do we get them into office? Because, it's, I mean, it's not like you can just have like a, uh, what's it called? Um, a tunnel that we can just smuggle them through. It is a process. And if we must have them in these same political parties that we're complaining about, they are still yeah. subject to the establishment, aren't they? So how do we find Absolutely. this way that you're talking about? So, so for me, I, I think that the only way forward that I can see at this moment, um, in this moment in time, at this point in our history, in our development as a country, is for people like Professor Kingsley Mogali, um, who Michael is representing on this show, for example, um, um, and other candidates that Nigerians still have some measure of respect, some measure of um, um, hope in, to come together. If this candidate, so if a Kingsley Mogali, for example, can work with maybe a Peter Obi, who some might argue for example, is not as bad as the mainstream uh, politicians that we have around. I can work with maybe an Adewoli Adebayo, who is the candidate of the Social Democratic Party right now. I can work with maybe a Kola Abiola, who is the candidate of the People's Redemption Party right now, you know, and a number of other people. There are 15 candidates right now. On the, that there will be 15 candidates on the ballot, right? Mm -hmm. Out of that 15, can we have seven, eight, maybe nine of them leave their um, personal interests, their personal ambitions, which, to be honest and to be realistic, um, uh, to be pragmatic, 
are unrealistic in the first place anyway. None of them can become president on their own. None. So can we have a situation where these guys come together in some sort of a collegiate structure um, and select one among themselves to represent the rest of them and best hope in that person to the Nigerian people? Can we see possibly an offset of some sort from this scenario? The party that that person runs on might be then no longer be relevant because there is a movement of the people behind okay. such a person. And okay. there is a movement of other candidates and other parties behind such a person. Okay. So obviously there are going to be a few interviews here and there in that process. But that, you know, if you have enough of uh, galvanization behind one person, there might be hope. But will they okay. do this? The question is in the air. Okay, I will come back to you because something just popped in my head when you said if they could all work together. But let me come back to Michael. Michael, your principle is, of course, the subjects of our conversation. Now, he did mention, um, he, he didn't ra rather disclose what his next political strategy would be. I ask this because uh, there was a subtle post by one of the presidential aspirants of the ADC, Chukuka Moye, um, right after the primaries, he, two words, Peter Obi. Um, and, and then it, it left a lot of people, you know, trying to speculate as to what his next move would be. But in your case, I do not know, I mean, if Mr. Mogalu has disclosed this to you, but what would be his strategy, his next political strategy? Uh, since he's exited the party, and this is not the first party he's exiting, what do you think would be his next move? Now, we also know that he has a following of sorts. It obviously means that if he's exiting the party, his following or his followers will exit the party. What would be your next move? Listening to what Shagun has said, is there going to be a collaboration, a synergy of sorts that would support a person that he might think would be worth working with? Well, uh, there are always a number of options are open in moments like this. Uh, but we, 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 he, he just left the country to run a quick medical check. Uh, as soon as he's back, we're going to sit down and review what has happened, um, look at some of these options, and then an announcement uh, will be made. Um, he, for his supporters, um, most of them would like for him to continue, you know, perhaps onto another independent party uh, and, and pick a ticket again, you know, but... Um, as soon as he's back, uh, this, um, the decision will be communicated to everybody. Mm. And, and, and I just want to just push you further because of what um, Shegu has said. Um, how how do, does this make you feel as a young person who's very enthusiastic about, you know, a better Nigeria? And, and you can see the number of young people who are, you know, coming out to get their voters card, being that they want to also be part of the electoral process come 2023. Now, with what's happened within the, the ADC, um, what's, what level of hope do you have in saving our Nigeria? You're breaking up. I can barely hear you. So I asked, I said, can you hear me now? Yes, I was saying, now that, you know, this has happened within the ADC and for a young person who's supporting um, an effort for a better Nigeria, a progressive Nigeria, what level of hope do you have now in building that Nigeria, in rescuing what's left of Nigeria, uh, especially as 2023 approaches? Well, it's encouraging to see really, um, in fact, um, admirable, you know, uh, the revolution, if you will, uh, you know, that's completely ongoing. Um, from the era of the NSAS a few years ago, the Nigerian youth have shown that, you know, they, they are starting to recognize their powers and also to um, what they can achieve, you know, if uh, given the, the opportunity and the right motivation. I can't say I know exactly, you know, uh, maybe the momentum right now is with Peter B, you know, and I'm actually very glad, both for him as a person, you know, and for the Nigerian youth. However, we must still understand that, you know, uh, social media uh, governization alone on its own does, does not win election, but this is a pointer you know, to, to what is to come and what we can achieve. It's very encouraging. I, I'm happy about it. 
and well, it, it gives one hope. But um, we wait to see um, how long we can sustain this momentum can be sustained. Because well, in my experience, we have the average Nigerian has um, a challenge, you know, with um, sustaining this kind. Of uh, Michael, are you still there? Oh, I think that we lost that connection with Michael. Well, Michael is uh, Michael Chimogu is the director of media and strategy to Professor Kingsley Mogalu, and uh, of course, um, Shegun Shopita is a good governance advocate. I want to say thank you to both gentlemen for being part of the conversation. And as we go on our first break, well, we will uh, come back to talk about uh, the extension of voter registration. Now, don't forget. Numbers of Nigerians are streaming out to get their registration done so that they can be part of the elections come 2023. We'll get to talk to the INEC officials um, on what their next move will be. Stay with us.